from CBS 4 News. This is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy and welcome to Facing South Florida. Now I realize the big news of the week is the Brian Flores lawsuit and the very serious allegations against Dolphin owner Stephen Ross that he engaged in a scheme to fix games, a charge he denies. And we will get into that in the weeks to come. But this morning, I want to keep the focus on the state legislature and the impact their decisions will have on working class families across the state. Senate Bill 1124 would do away with living wage ordinances in cities and counties across Florida. Miami-Dade, Broward, Palm Beach, and cities like Miami and Miami Beach all have living wage ordinances. In Miami-Dade, it says that if you want a county contract, if you want to do business with the county, you have to pay your workers a minimum of $14 an hour. Senate Bill 1124 does away with that. It lowers the bar to the state's minimum wage of $10 an hour. So a worker who would make $29,000 a year with the living wage ordinance would see their pay cut to $21,000 a year. This would impact tens of thousands of working class families across the state. This week, I sat down with the sponsor of Senate Bill 1124, State Senator Joe Gruters. It has nothing to do with living wages or minimum wages. It doesn't touch those. The counties can do whatever they want. This deals with contracts that local governments enter into in where there's government funded buildings. And what's happening is you're creating a situation where it, you're, you're, it, it, it's a distortion of the market and it hurts everybody, uh, hurt, hurts small businesses, minority businesses that are trying to break in that do a lot of subcontracting work on these big jobs. But let's talk in terms of the actual numbers and the actual impact this has. This would uh, have an effect on Miami-Dade's living wage ordinance that a person with benefits would receive $14 an hour. That's $29,000 a year. As a result of your bill, those workers would now be readjusted down to $10 an hour, which means that they would have an annual salary of $21,000. I mean, nobody's getting rich on because of Miami-Dade's living wage ordinance. And my understanding from talking to county officials is that this would impact 22,000 individuals, 22,000 families who currently get the living wage in Miami-Dade County would now see their wages cut from $29,000 a year to $21,000 a year. And the, and the county could still have a living wage. My bill doesn't address the living wage. It addresses specific issues as it relates to county contracts. And it, 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 it impacts everybody. The taxpayers at the end of the day pays those additional money. But, but, if, but, if, but if as part of the contract, but wait, wait just, just to be clear, but, as part, but if as part of the contract, they say the employer must pay Miami-Dade County's living wage to get this contract, this would prevent the county from doing that. Is that not correct? It, well, that could be correct with that specific contract, but the real issue is they could still pay the, the living wage, just doesn't address that. This deals with uh, tradespeople, and for example, it goes, the heart of this is, let's say, a plumber. So you have a plumber that legit, I think the wage is, I think is $65 an hour, and they're laying pipe, doing other things, uh, there are some jobs that you don't have to do, moving materials that all, all, all of a sudden Miami and other, some of the, these other counties are forcing them to pay the $65 an hour and it's two different jobs. No, 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 no. Nobody's forcing anybody in Miami-Dade County to pay someone $65 an hour to do a job that wouldn't pay 65. The, the right. floor, the floor would be $14 an hour. No. They have to make the living wage. The living wage in Miami-Dade County is $14 an hour. Your bill would take it down to 10. Well, it, Jim, here, here's what I'll do. I will amend my bill to allow the $14 to stay because that's th this has nothing to do with the living wage amendment. I'm happy to, uh, to change the bill if that is the case, if it's going to take it from $14 to $10. That's a, that's a very, uh, the, the, that is not the intent of the bill. Uh, the intent of the, of the bill is to make sure we're able to, to bring in good contractors, to make sure we're not impacting uh, affordable housing, the fact, the fact that we're not passing on the, the, the cost of, of, of that. 
additional wage on the backs of the taxpayers is that who that's who pays at the end of, at the end of the day and I, and I, and you raise an excellent point about 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 uh, affordable housing i mean that's that's a huge issue throughout the state it's a particularly painful issue here in south florida so when you talk about taking someone down you know nobody's getting wealthy i mean you cannot live high on the hog in in miami-dade county on twenty nine thousand dollars a year you know that's i'm with that's, you i'm with you yeah if that's if that's if that's the case if that's their objection i'm willing to amend my bill to say uh it won't touch the living wage in these contracts whatsoever my goal is the much higher end uh, where you have trade skills, pe skilled people, uh, where you're basically saying that everybody that touches any type of pipe has to get paid $65 an hour, and it really hurts those entry level people. And what you have is you have a flood of pe plumbers from around the state that all want that $65 an hour because they're guaranteed it, uh, regardless of skill and regardless of type of job that they're doing. This is not about the $10 to $14 an hour workers. I'm happy to amend that to make sure we clarify that. So. Uh, all those people could be uh, compensated accordingly. Let's go to a bill that I think the public will actually, that, that I think that you'll have universal support on. You want to give the ability for local elected officials to ban smoking on public beaches. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a great bill. Hopefully one that everybody can get behind. You know, uh, my county, Sarasota County, tried to ban uh, smoking on public beaches, you know, 15 years ago, the ACLU sued because only the state is allowed to uh, impose uh, the restrictions on tobacco use. And so what I wanna do is I wanna give the power back to communities to take that ability that they wanna ban smoking or perhaps have uh, designated smoking areas on the beach. Because I know with my three little kids, we go to the beach, there's nothing more disgusting than have uh, the, somebody smoking right next to you and having that secondhand smoke. I think it infringes on the quiet enjoyment of all of our visitors, both locally and our tourists. Let's go to uh, Senate Bill 774. And again, I'll paraphrase and you correct me if, if I'm understanding this wrong. This bill would, for practical purposes, say that if a firefighter or a police officer contracts COVID, the assumption will be that it is a job-related injury and that they would therefore be eligible for workers' compensation. Jim, you, you nailed that one perfectly. And, and you know these guys are, and gals are putting their lives on the line every day. And the, the hard thing about COVID-19 is, is how can you prove where you contracted COVID-19 from? I mean, it could have been anywhere, but a lot of these people, especially during the beginning of the, the pandemic, you, you didn't know uh, uh, police officers, firefighters going on calls, assisting individuals, and people contract it and why not go ahead and, and, and let's go ahead and uh, make sure that we take care of our first responders and allow them to uh, take the benefits that uh, come with that this bill. Is there something inconsistent though in in the bill in the sense that we make the assumption that first responders have contracted COVID because of their work yet if I'm and I'll use the example, the famous case from down here in Miami Beach, a, a Publix deli worker who goes to work, deals with customers every, you know, 50, 60, 80, 100 customers a day is, is told they can't wear a mask because Publix at the time prevented it. He contracts COVID and dies. You know, as a result, we saw COVID liability protection, which makes it virtually impossible for, a, for an employee to sue their company going forward for COVID if th that they believe was contracted unless they can absolutely prove it genetically that the COVID came from the workplace. Is and there anything right. inconsistent between well, the two? It, it, Jim, it, very good points because you're never gonna be able to prove where you, we contracted it from. That's the tough thing. But what we're doing with the firefighter and first responder bill is basically giving them the benefit of the doubt and just saying, listen, you're a first responder. Uh, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, let you uh, uh, declare workers' comp if you uh, contract it, uh, because it's going to be the obligation of the state regardless. Uh, it, to me, it's a uh, the least we can do for first responders as they continuously put their lives on the line to help all of us. Let's go to another bill that you've got, which I'm not sure who's necessarily opposing, because I'm not even sure it's an issue. It's your national anthem bill. Is there any team that doesn't play the national anthem right now? 
Well, the best way to describe this bill is I think there's 13 uh, organizations right now that receive government funding. Some people don't think that these stadiums uh, should get any government funding, but there's 13 that get about a million dollars, $1.1 million a year. I think they get it for like 50 years. Uh, if you don't want to take government tax dollars, then you don't have to play the national anthem. I think it's a small- But is this a problem somewhere? Is there a problem with this? No problem, but as we've experienced, you know, there's been some- uh, we, we've, there's been a lot of uh, turbulence as a result of the national anthem and, and, and some people thinking they shouldn't play it. And we're just trying to make sure that the taxpayers, if we're footing the bill for some of these stadiums and the upkeep, upkeep and the maintenance, I think it's a small price to pay. They don't have to do the national anthem, but they also don't have to take $1.1 million a year. To me, I think it's a fair trade-off. Let's talk about another bill, which is more controversial, dealing with uh, education and it does several things. I, I, mean, I don't know if it's just one bill or maybe a couple of bills that you have. I know that there are several elements of these bills, one of which uh, would create, and I want you to explain it. I don't want to try to paraphrase it, but as I understand it, it would create a review committee to go through books and other measures to see if they line up with state curriculum but the fear would be that this becomes a committee of people to try to figure out what books to censor. Yeah, and that's a great point. And there's a lot, and as the Senate Education Chairman, we have a lot of books. There are some bills that, that did not move through my agenda, and, and that may be one of the ones you were describing. I do have a bill, we have lots of the good bills, but the one that's getting the most attention is the one where I'm trying to create a more open and transparent system for the parents and for the community members and because most of the complaints that we get are from elementary uh, the school children's parents on what's being taught in their schools and what books and what this will do it won't change the process of how a book will be banned or anything like that all it does is it says that any instructional materials or books that are available to your child uh, if you're in an elementary school will be listed on a website for a parent to be able to go in and check and see and, uh, and then if, if, if there was an issue with a particular book, then they would go address it the same way they do now. Go talk to the principal. If that doesn't resolve it, go bring it in front of the school board, for example. Uh, that doesn't resolve it, maybe the DOE. So it's, it, it, my bill is about open seat, it's about open and transparency, and trying to make sure parents understand exactly what's being taught in schools. And another uh, bill is that we have going on, and actually the same bill, uh, will tie school board member salaries. And in the Senate, we're saying that it should be tied to our salaries. You know, there's only two elected offices uh, that are part-time in their role, and that's county commissioners and school board members. And the latest survey of school board members say that they work less than 40, uh, 40 hours per month, uh, yet they're paid, some are paid uh, uh, upwards of 40 to, to close to $50,000. We're a part-time legislature. We're up here about in Tallahassee three and a half months a year, uh, plus all the time we spend back at home. We pay, we get paid about twenty-eight, twenty-nine thousand. I think that's a fair price. I think the House wants to pay them nothing. I think the school board members should get paid. I think it's a it's it's a lot of time and effort, and we should compensate those that want to give their time and effort to to a, to cause like that. Uh, and that bill will move the system, will uh, hopefully uh, agree on a price by the time uh, it gets to the floor. So again, just, just to put specifics on it for down here, currently school board members in Dade and Broward earn about $47,000 a year. Under your bill, it would take them to $29,000 roughly, twenty-nine, thirty thousand, somewhere in that range. Again, do you, do you I mean, do you think people in South Florida are just being paid way too much? I mean, uh, what? I don't understand the logic here in the sense that, like, are you, is, because the perception of this bill is that you had the larger counties, which this will directly impact, the Dades, the Browers, the Hillsboroughs, who were also defiant of the governor when it came to mask issues uh, and school opening issues, that this is a form of punishment to them and to smack them down a little and put them back in line by cutting their salary by a third. Well, for a part-time position, I think 47,000 is, is, is a lot. I think 29,000 is fair. Like I said, it's one of two part-time positions uh, that, that are elected office. And if it, it becomes too much work, the school board could certainly add more members and cut that uh, time down that they need to spend. But at the end of the day, uh, what's a fair price to pay school board members? 
Uh, 17 counties under my bill would receive a raise. Uh, the, the, the rest will probably receive some type of pay cut. But at the end of the day, I think tying them to our salaries is, is more than fair. After our interview, Senator Gruders called me and said after taking a closer look at his bill, he acknowledged that it would hurt working families. He says that was never his intent, and he said he would now change his bill so it will not interfere with the living wage ordinances across the state. We'll be sure to stay on top of that. When we come back, Miami-Dade Mayor Danielle Levine-Cava, who just came back from Tallahassee herself, stay with us.